which is me. Hello guys, what am I doing today? What am I doing today? I am stitching in some components for a key wallet. Right, normally I would go live on Instagram. This is the first time I've ever gone live on YouTube. I've done plenty of recordings for YouTube, but this is the first time going live. So instead of looking at my mug, I'm gonna bring you down here. There we go. So I'm just doing some components for a key wallet. And I'll show you what that is. It's probably something you've seen before. Uh, it's a wallet where you hold your keys, believe it or not, using one of these. So you've probably seen those before, so you can attach your keys to each one of those little loops. And it encloses all your keys to keep them safe, but it also has components that you can put cards in, okay? So credit cards and debit cards and things like that. So what I'm doing today is just stitching them in so they're reinforced and they have a backing material on them. And on the front, you can see there, I've already done a little bit of stitching on this one. So I've got a couple more to go. And I'll probably do another live again if this one turns out to be successful and people enjoy it. Uh, so you can see kind of the, the whole project kind of coming in. Right. So I'm just gonna prick before I stitch. You know, I would have thought there would be uh, kind of people talking on the side and that kind of thing, but uh, I guess you don't get that. Normally I do Instagram live. You get to see people talking to you. So this is, uh, is an interesting one for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm going all the way through on this because there's only a thin part. It's only a thin component. Okay. Right, can you guys actually kind of talk back to me? You don't have to say anything if you want to, but wave or say hello or something. Because if there's no interaction on this live, I don't really understand the point of it. It's just a bit weird, isn't it? Welcome to live chat. Remember to guard your privacy and abide by our community guidelines. Learn more. There we go. You can actually talk on here. I thought I was going crazy. I thought, what have I done? Have I got the wrong update or what's going on here? Uh, let's bring you around. There you go. Sounds good. Excellent. All right. Yeah, I thought it'd be a bit weird. <laughs> Just me talking into the camera, no interaction. That would have been odd. Mm -hmm. So I'm just equaling up my thread. So these, uh, these parts have to be stitched in first before they can be placed inside the wallet. Because once they're in, you can't then stitch them. There wouldn't be room for your needles. Interesting thing about this is uh, whenever you guys say anything, uh, like two seconds later, it disappears from the screen. So if I'm not looking up, I'll miss whatever you say to me. Whereas on Instagram, it kind of just stays there and you can scroll up to see what you missed. So this is interesting. We'll see how it goes. We will see. So I have pricked all the way through, but these little slits made by, um, I'm using some Kevin, Kevin Lee irons here, these little 2.7, they're, uh, they're really difficult to kind of see. So you end up having to kind of like 
push your right needle through to see it on the left side. So what I do is I stitch with an awl, but this is just like a, a round or, hold on guys, I literally saw a question there. Oh, if I touch the screen, it comes back, look at that. See, I'm learning all the time. Hello from France. Hey Phil, says James, what a pleasant surprise. Yeah, a pleasant surprise for me. I didn't know I was going on live on YouTube until I, uh, until about 15 minutes ago, I thought, well, I'm gonna do some stitching anyway. Let's go live. Why not try YouTube? So I downloaded the app, which I didn't have on my phone, and uh, just went live, which is cool. So I'll touch the screen again. Hey, it comes back. What size needle and thread are you using? Uh, pretty much what you're saying there. Uh, 004, same here. Uh, 0 0.3, uh, I don't know what this is. 632. But that's obviously your French size there. Yeah, 4.5, 4.5, 4 4.6. I'm sure it varies very slightly being Philly Chinois. Um, but uh, yeah, 0.45. So I'll bring you guys in a little bit closer in a second. Hmm, I didn't go all the way through. So I'm going to use a bladed awl for that one. That's strange. I wonder why. Sometimes I think when there's a little cutout on the table, it pushes the leather into the cutout and it uh, stops it actually severing the fibers through. Uh, let's change, change your location. So you have a little bit of a different view here. Apologies. There we go. You guys saying hello? Hello. Hope the weather's nice where you are. It's been uh, raining all day. I was actually gonna walk to the workshop. I got to the end of my road and my shoes, my legs were soaked. <laughs> it just literally two minutes after I left the house, it started to, uh, a uh, monsoon came through, it seems. So I have to go back and get in the car. But the sun came out earlier, which was rather nice. So if you guys do have any questions, just let me know and I'll periodically uh, look in there. It's raining here in Texas. Uh, 48, 48 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny in Tampa. Oh, that's a good temperature. That's a lovely temperature. Yeah, I do like the sun. I don't like too much heat. Never have done. Maybe I'm a bit weird. So this is a turned edge for those of you that don't know. So I'm gonna give you a, a little bit of a, a closer look here so far. Obviously these stitches haven't been tapped down yet. So I'm stitching in this part first of all, at the top. If I turn over, you can see it's actually a flap that gets turned over um, onto the other side. So there's no edge paint or anything. It's literally just the leather. And in this case, it's goatskin, Italian goatskin. Placing that in the clams, moving it a little bit further up. We have a question here and the question is, what made you choose that all? Was it handy or, or did you pick it up? Pick it to go with your thread size. Um, if you're talking about this all, it's literally just a round all. These holes uh, are punched all the way through, except a couple of them, obviously, um, punched all the way through. So it's literally just to open up the hole for me, but this isn't sharp on the end. So I've chosen that just because it's helping me to uh, locate the holes. Because it's such a fine uh, pricking iron I was using, 2.7, and they're very, very sharp, fine teeth. It's quite difficult to see them, especially on the rear side as you're stitching. 
Uh, I bought this all into play because one of the holes wasn't uh, cut all the way through, so I just finished it off. But uh, I'm using the round awl. It's not a very common practice, not many people do that, but whenever I'm using, you know, matching thread, red on red is what you're seeing here. And uh, a fine pricking iron, it makes it a little bit difficult to see, so I just grab a round awl and it just opens up the hole, gives me something to aim for. And I find it helps me a little bit. Hi from Derbyshire. Paul Smith says, in Kent, we've had heavy, heavy showers and then beautiful, bright sunlight. Not that I can see a lot of the sun, but the rain sounded hard. Uh, yes, uh, I'm also in Kent, so I had the exact same experience as you. <laughs> I'm in Faversham. So this particular part, this is actually going to be um, for storing cards in. Uh, the next one I'm going to stitch in is, is like a double-sided version of this, and this is actually like a key plate. Uh, it's just like a barrier that protects the rest of the wallet from the keys. Which I'll be stitching up momentarily, so almost at the end of this one here. Hello from California, USA. How do you choose the needle size for the thread? Uh, generally, I use the smallest needle possible, but the, the needle that I use 99.9% .9 of the time is uh, John James 004. And if I'm doing some, you know, thick stitching, uh, which requires a longer needle, and thicker thread as well. So you need a larger needle with a bigger eye. Then I'll upgrade to uh, 002. But uh, not very often beyond that. Uh, sometimes, I'd, I don't know the name of it. I bought it in a, a leather shop in Canada. Uh, some needles, they like this. Uh, like the 004, but they're about a centimeter longer and they're great for box stitching or when you need that extra length, but you don't want the extra width. But again, I don't know, don't know who, who actually makes them. But I'll show you an example of something I would use uh, uh, larger needles for. So this was a project I did for one of the courses. Uh, this is a trunk handle. So this goes on a trunk, obviously, and this is an example of where I would actually use uh, a larger needle. As you can see, you've got much thicker thread there, stitched through, and you're going through about 13, 14 millimeters of leather there. Okay, so just over half an inch. So for something like that, these, these needles would be a bit anemic for that. You wouldn't really have much to grab onto by the time you push them through. Andrea Hoyle, hello. Hello from North Carolina, USA. You should have said I'm severely visually impaired. I'm from Maidstone, not far away from you. Ah. Hello from Georgia, USA. Wow, that's thick. Yeah, you should see my trunk handle too. Right, that's enough of that. Uh, where is my, there we go. So I'm just gonna nip those threads. And I'll move you guys around with me a little bit. Uh, hopefully it doesn't make you feel nauseous. So let's bring this over here and bring you guys down. Okay, so I'm just going to tuck those threads back in there. Uh, 
So this seam really is just reinforcing that turned edge uh, that without the seam, you wouldn't have uh, you wouldn't have that kind of protection to stop it from uh, flapping back open again. What I'm going to need is a scrap piece of leather. Did I say this was an impromptu live, guys? <laughs> uh, anytime you have a finely grained piece of leather like this, okay, it's difficult to see. I don't know how good this camera is doing a live on uh, YouTube, but anytime you have that fine grain, uh, it's very easy to hammer that out. So what I like to do is uh, take the face side of the leather, face it down onto a piece of scrap. This is chrome tan scrap because it gives. You want something a bit spongy. And uh, you can tap those stitches down. Okay, and if you want a little bit more on that side, you can just very lightly get the tops of the threads and that way you can preserve that beautiful grain that lovely texture um, that's very easy to to mash out so what do I need now I need my creaser quick blowtorch So there's already a crease on there, um, but we just, once you finish stitching it, sometimes it just wraps that beautiful crease. We're just gonna bring that back like so. And you get that nice crease in there, which just kind of like brings out those stitches and gives that beautiful look to it. You can't see it on camera, but it has a bit of a shine to it because I like to keep these nice and polished, just occasionally rub it up and down on your uh, strop with some green compound and it imparts a polish to the end there and then when you crease a line it gives a polish to your leather as well. So this is one of the pockets where you'll have cards going in and out of. The next one is this one here. Apologies if you're saying things to me I can't actually see right now because the uh, camera is facing down but this is where we'll be attaching this part Okay, so all the keys go in here. So this is like a key plate and it protects the rest of the wallet, but you can also actually put cash behind it. So uh, now we're going to go and prick the sides of these and then stitch them as well. Now, I don't know how long we actually get on a live on, uh, on YouTube. I actually have no idea. I know on Instagram it's an hour. So I'm just going to move you guys up. Uh, I don't know if it's the same thing on YouTube Live, or you could just keep going. Let's have a look at comments. That's a nice gauge. Hello from Seal. I love the fact that your hand stitch sewing machine limits the amount of people that can get into the hobby, and hand stitching has. It's limits while machines are limited by the leather thickness, etc. Yeah, I mean, you can get you can get machines that will stitch through that trunk handle without any issues whatsoever. Um, but hand stitching is 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 kind of like part craft, part art, really, and that's that's where it differs. I don't think, you know, I'm not one of these people that says uh, I don't agree with machine stitching at all. I think it obviously has its place. Um, but it's not what I enjoy. It's not what I'm passionate about, so I don't use it. But, you know, if I was uh, stitching a bag and it had a lot of material components, internal components, like a drop-in lining that was made of canvas, for example, uh, then machine stitching is, is perfectly acceptable on that. Uh, what size creaser am I using? I don't know. Uh, 1.5. Uh, this probably sounds weird, but have you ever come across any severely visually impaired leather workers? Uh, I, I haven't met any personally, uh, but I do have someone who is blind 
who's a student of the courses uh, and likes to, obviously you can't see them, but can listen to them. And uh, with the help of somebody else, uh, does their leather work. Uh, but I know that, but I don't know how they do it or anything, which is pretty amazing, really. Right, okay, so what am I doing? Right, we need to prick two new lines down this part. So there's two components done already. And this is the central key guard. Apologies if this is really loud in your ears or it's shaking the camera. This is the first time doing a YouTube live, so I'll be able to kind of review it all back and see, see what works and what doesn't work. So it's good fun so far. Hope you guys are enjoying it too. If you are, let me know. Okay, so that's one side. And I'm not going quite to the ends because obviously we've got a perimeter stitch that's going to go all the way around. And I'm actually going to do edge binding in this one. Move you guys a bit further away. I'm going to do edge binding for this, which is a very thin strip of leather that goes around the outside. So there'll be absolutely no edge paint nor no burnishing. It's just edge binding and turned edges. So all edges are made of leather. Sure, you guys can see what's going on. Uh, how many more can we come up? One more. Should have gone two there. No problem. Do I sell a lot in my shop? Uh, well, what I do now, I used to have a business called Finch England, which I still legally own, but now I, my business is called the Leathercraft Masterclass. So I teach Leathercraft courses. So that is my full-time occupation at the moment. So I don't sell made-to-order leather goods anymore, whereas I used to. Now it is full-time teaching. So if you go to leathercraftmasterclass.com, you will see what I do. So threading these needles. Couple of locks in there. Okay, so we're now gonna do one side and then we can switch to the other. I'm gonna bring you guys back round. Adjust you up a little bit more. There we go. Now we can stay nice and still. <laughs> all right. Get my all ready. Andrew Hodel, that's some trunk handle, yes. <laughs> hey Phil, have you thought about selling your courses in a package of one project each? I used to, I used to, but the issue is, 
Say, for example, I'm uh, teaching a course on how to make uh, luggage or a leather case or box or something like that. And I mention a skill that's necessary to complete the work. Well, because I sell everything all at once in a package, I can say to finish these edges, see this course or to learn how to do this, see this course so I can just reference them. So if somebody wants to do a project, but they're not, they don't have all the skills necessary already honed and they haven't uh, learned how to do them, it's going to be incredibly frustrating when I say, oh, to learn how to do this, go and see that course. Well, of course, then they then have to go and buy that one as well. And I might reference another course in that course. So it just makes more sense to have all the courses as one complete package. Otherwise, I'd have to teach people how to hand stitch, how to edge finish and do everything in every single course every time. Um, so that is the major reason why I don't do that. I used to, but that was the issue. So uh, I made the decision to have them all as one complete package. So when you purchase a plan on leathercraftmasterclass.com, uh, you get, I've no idea how many courses I have anymore. It's, I know it's over 50. The exact number I uh, cannot remember, 50 something, averaging over an hour each. So they are full length courses. Hey Phil, any books or eBooks you'd recommend for beginners and intermediate leather workers alike, other than the ones you have referenced on your site? Um, I mean, I got a huge collection, but I don't remember all their names. But I, I have had it in my mind for the last few weeks, actually. But I've just got some new books in. And I was going to do a video on YouTube about my recommendations and just kind of have a flick through and give people an idea of what each book is like and why I like it. But as for their names, uh, Art and Techniques of Leather is a French book, which is probably one of my favorites. I mean, you've got Valerie Michael's book, um, The Leather Working Guide, I think it's called. And a few others. I mostly get inspiration from books on bags and books on leather and things like that, more so than uh, leather crafting books, because most of them are you know, aimed right at beginners because it's a larger market. So for intermediate, not a lot, I'm afraid. Maybe one day I'll write one. <laughs> Your stitching is same my way. Okay, so this is my right hand, by the way, and this is my left hand. Um, you got a mirror image Unfortunately, I don't know if uh, YouTube will realize that and then upload it in reverse, but you are seeing a mirror image of me and my workshop. It's weird that the comments disappear as soon as you stop touching the screen. I'll be the first one in line. <laughs> Well, that was one of the things I was, I have half a written book, that's the thing. And then I decided halfway through writing the book, why don't I just show people instead of telling people? Uh, because I just think you can learn so much more from video than you can from a book. I love books. I have a huge book collection on all different subjects outside of Leathercraft, but you just can't beat video and visually seeing. If you're a visual learner, then you're never going to have enough photographs in a book to compare to uh, to something you can see. So that's when I decided to quit writing the book and start doing leatherworking courses online through video. And that has been, in my opinion, a lot more successful than the book was ever going to be. And I can come out with a new course every three to four weeks, whereas coming out with a new book can take sometimes years. So uh, progress is slow. 
But books are great, and I'd love to come out with a book for no other reason other than just the romance of <laughs> of, uh, of having a book, which would be nice. Then I could be one of those people that puts author, entrepreneur, philanthropist, leather craftsman extraordinaire on their uh, Instagram profiles. <laughs> All right, so coming up to one side, these are little tiny 2.7 millimeter stitches, so they are very, very small. So it takes a while to get to the end of the seam. That's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. Where is the scissors? You guys are hiding the scissors behind the camera. That's what you're doing. I'm enjoying this YouTube live. Oh, that's good, me too. Don't get me wrong, your videos are inspiring. Thank you very much. Uh, being a leatherworking half god yourself, <laughs> is there a skill or technique you'd want to improve on? Uh, every single one of them. Every single one of them. Um, and I, I literally mean that, because you can never perfect absolutely everything. You can never perfect nipping the threads at the exact length so that when you tuck them, it doesn't push it through to the other side and there isn't any left on the surface. You know, there's, there's a skill and there's a technique to absolutely everything that you do. Um, ignore this mess, just pretend it's not here. Right? Uh, there's an absolute skill to, to every part of it. And the skill that I would probably most want to to improve on is the skill to constantly learn and be curious because that's what really in my opinion is the key to success if you can stay interested in in all the little details and not get bored or fed up with it uh, and it takes work it takes work to stay interested in something to see it through Sometimes you've got to work on a project and it's not particularly interesting and you've got to kind of plow through and can continue until you kind of get your mojo back and that interest kind of like peaks again because it's always difficult to stay really motivated all the time about absolutely everything. So yeah, that's what my answer would be. So this is our key plate. So this has a double turned edge as you can see. So this is your your protection for the wallet from the keys. What we'll be attaching this to for those joining the live now. Okay, so that's what that goes on there. So this is gonna have gold hardware. So it's red, goat skin and gold. Obviously not solid gold. I don't think Wooter Leather will be selling solid gold uh, key hardware. Might be interesting, wouldn't it? All right, so let's remove these. And we've put some th fresh thread on there. Here's a piece I cut and waxed earlier. Me too, YouTube Live. Yeah, this is good fun. It's a little different because it's horizontal instead of vertical. Now, I can do that. I can actually have it the other way up. But when someone watches it normally on YouTube, on the, their PC, the computer, laptop, or whatever, it will be like a, a slit of a video with two giant black bars either side. I don't know, I might, I might next time do a vertical video like I normally do on Instagram Live, see how it works. Because I think most people are now on, on their phones, aren't they? watching YouTube, so it probably makes sense to do a vertical video of portrait versus landscape, which is what this is, because you can't see my face, and that may, may be a good or bad thing, depending on whether you like me or not, but uh, okay, you're kind of limited with the landscape portrait. You see a little bit more in Leathercraft. Uh, this is... <laughs> I've picked up one of those needles where I've actually removed the point on it. Sometimes I do that. If I'm stitching something that's particularly difficult or tight and it's easy to snag a thread, I use one of these needles where I've actually rounded it a bit more. The other one's fine. 
must have picked it up by accident. Okay, let's bring you, let's bring you back in. Prakash says, well, this is a lovely surprise. It is indeed. I thought, you know what? Let's download the YouTube app and see if we can perform one of those live things instead of Instagram. Uh, and I'll see how it goes. Because I haven't got the same subscribers on YouTube that I do on Instagram, but it's starting to grow. So I thought, you know what? Let's see how it goes on YouTube. On the YouTubes. Uh, what thread? Yeah, Philo Chinois. La Cable. Reviewing the books would be uh, would be great. Yeah, I mean it wouldn't be all Leathercraft books. I mean I recently bought uh, a load of books on handbags, mostly like the history of handbags, um, iconic handbags over the years, uh, things like that. And there was one; it's a really good one. I forget the name of it, but I'll definitely put that in the in the review. Is uh, a book about a handbag museum in South Korea and uh, the making of a museum. Handbags, the making of a museum is, is what I think it's called. Fantastic book. You can get it at a great price too. It should be more expensive. Um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful book. Amazing. Some of the pieces that they have from history. A lot of English work as well, which is you rarely see these days. And it's just a really a joy to uh, to kind of flick through. Just gives you a little bit of inspiration because on a lot of these historical bags, you can you can pick up these little techniques and little nuances and things that you could you can figure out that they did just from the pictures that you rarely see these days, and then integrate it into your own work. Um, because a lot of people get their inspiration from, say, just Instagram or YouTube and one or two other places, but everybody's being inspired by everybody else. But sometimes you either got to make up a completely new idea or look to the past. And, uh, and that's what I really like these books for. You can kind of look through the history of bags and, and take parts of uh, historical bags, uh, which I'm doing on a new course at the moment which is making a top frame handbag. One second. Uh, where has it gone? There it is. So talking of historical components, this is a top frame. So that goes on top of a bag. Obviously it still needs to be stitched in to an actual bag, but there's some parts that I've kept very, very true to the original um, which was a top frame, which would have been added by a saddler to the top of a carpet bag. And those are the original kind of beginnings of this style. And that is where some of these techniques come from. So they're very, very old techniques, but taught in a modern way, obviously. And this is a course that's just come out on leathercraftmasterclass.com. Uh, part two is coming soon, which is wrapping the frame, adding the hardware, the rivets, uh, and installing everything else. But that's the kind of thing I'm talking about, is the traditional aspect of leathercraft. I think uh, there's so much that's got lost in the past that sometimes just looking back, you can get so much inspiration. Going off on a tangent there, I do that a lot. Linen is expensive thread, is it? Why do I prefer linen? Yeah, for the same reasons I just pretty much uh, stated about the bags. It's, I like the historical aspect of it. Um, it's a much more natural looking thread. Don't get me wrong, I have a huge selection of polyester thread. And where it works, I'll use that instead. Especially if it's going to be, if it's going to take a lot of heavy wear. Um, it's built for the outdoors and that kind of thing, but uh, I, I like the look of linen. It's a much more matte finish to it. A lot of uh, polyesters and synthetics tend to have a bit of a sheen to it, a bit of a shine, and it makes it just look like a machine thread, especially if you're good at hand stitching and you use a, a shiny thread. Uh, no one's going to know it's really a hand stitch. 
And there's something about almost the rustic nature of Philip Chinois, Barber's Linen, Campbell's, things like that. Um, you could just tell it's a hand stitch. It's just more natural looking. But that's a personal opinion. It doesn't mean I'm right, of course. It's just what I've found works for me. But what works for you is, is really up to your own preference and your own experiences. It's probably more of a philosophical thing than a practical thing, to be honest with you. I mean, other than resisting extreme heat, <laughs> there's, not a, there's not a lot that linen's going to be better for than uh, polyester. Almost at the end of this stitch here. Haven't needed to use the round all, kind of given up on that. Uh, I love books, says Andrea. I'm a visual learner and a book learner. Yeah, I like books for concepts and ideas for visually learning how to physically do something. Because uh, I've got books on things like woodworking and stuff like that, but it doesn't compare to watching a, a video on someone actually making the thing. Oop, threads come off there. Use this opportunity to see what we're going. I think Phil prefers the aesthetics of linen. Says James, yes. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a tradition, it's a heritage. It's a, I guess it's a philosophy. I mean, the company that makes this has been making thread in Lille in France for over 200 years. And they still polish the thread with horse hair after it comes out uh, a wax bath. You know, it's just little things like that. I'm like, yes, I love that. I love that. Is it relevant in the modern world? I don't care at that point. I just love the idea of, you know, really keeping a tradition and a heritage alive because what is leatherwork if it's not a historical craft? It's one of the oldest crafts in, of, of time. That doesn't mean we can't move on and use more modern materials and reinforcements and synthetics when necessary, but there's a part of me that really loves to keep that tradition going. Um, so I do where I can, and where it's not practical, uh, I may decide not to. I've not tried linen yet, but I will do somewhere. Uh, yeah, it's, you'll notice that it's a little bit more stretch resistant. Um, so you generally don't need to pull that thread as tight as you might with polyester, which gives a little bit. You pull it and then it relaxes. Um, on linen, it's not so much. So you may over tighten your stitches if you're used to polyester. Just something to be aware of. Okay. Okay, so let's tuck these threads in. So what's good about uh, YouTube Live versus uh, Instagram Live is it actually tells me in the top of the screen, I've been on here for 43 minutes and 37 seconds. Uh, Instagram doesn't do that. It just lets you know 10 seconds before, <laughs> before it just ends, which is so annoying. Okay, so tuck these in. So just getting that below the surface. And uh, which one did I do? I did that one. And the end thread is there. Polished hammer, a nice polished hammer there. Don't know if you can see that, maybe you can. Kind of, it's covered in wax. Okay, do we need 
need to do any more on the surface, a little bit. Just to flatten those stitches just a tad. And that's that little uh, trick of using a little bit of hide on there. Is pretty, you won't be able to see it, but it hasn't lost that real nice grain texture as if you start wailing on it from here. It's a bit of an exaggerated example. I don't know if you can see that, but it's gone like super smooth. Okay, it's lost that kind of rough grain texture and it's gone kind of shiny and smooth. And uh, it really, it kind of stands out on a fine grain. So that's how to avoid it. Matt is very nice, it is. Poly is glossy, it can be. Um, if you've got a properly waxed, oops, you're on my calculator guys, careful. Um, if, it, if it's, you know, heavily waxed or it's done right, I mean, woo to leather actually, I've got a few of theirs and it, that doesn't tend to look uh, glossy, but there are some that I have, I think Serafil is quite glossy, MBT is quite glossy. It's just, just aesthetics, it's personal preference, isn't it? Paul Porter, hello, Mr. Porter, how are you? It's 3.46 a.m. where you are. <laughs> All right, so there you go. You can have another look at my mug. <laughs> All right, so that's what I was doing today. So stitching in these two components, which are um, for the key wallet on the side. So they'll be facing inwards this way. And that's where you're, well, behind it, where the cards go. And right in the center of those two will be this piece, which is where our key attachments go to. And this thing is gonna be uh, completely edge bound as well. So there's gonna be a binding around the entire edge around the perimeter and there's also going to be some padding but more on that later so hopefully later on um, when I'm a little bit further on in the build and there's a little bit more to actually do uh, I'll do another live and we can uh, we can have another conversation but I uh, appreciate you guys uh, stopping by the best is finding antique leather work and seeing a technique that you don't see anymore yeah I'd you know when, uh, when I had my business, Finch England, obviously I was making a lot of brand new stuff. Watches, wallets, bags, things like that. Um, but on the side to kind of supplement my business, I'd do a lot of buying and selling of uh, vintage pieces as well, especially English leather work. So what I would do is I would buy it in a state, then I would do it up, do, redo all the stitching, repair it where necessary, and then I would take all some, you know, some nice photography and sell it at a much higher price. So it was... I was kind of just doing more than leather work to supplement the business. And that was one of the things that I enjoyed the most and probably where I learned a lot of what I know now as well was taking apart these bags and kind of reading the work as if it was a book written by a craftsman from over a hundred years ago sometimes. So they're, they're long gone, but their legacy is still there and I'm still learning from them as I kind of take their work apart very, very carefully and sometimes find messages by them on the inside, which is really, really cool. Um, but yeah, the, there's so much, so many great techniques um, that have kind of been lost to history. And that's one of the things I want to bring back. Handsome, thank you very much. Glad you think so. Marina G says, restoring old bags is super sustainable. Yes, it is. Especially when you're using the traditional glues, like I'd use like uh, hide glue, for example. Another one is wheat starch or wheat paste glue which you boil up uh, for an hour and it's, uh, it's amazing how long it lasts for. People talk about, you know, this, you know, brand new type of super, you know, super duper glue is better than this one. And people argue on, in, on Leathercraft forums about, you know, what's better, Saragum or this other new brand. And, you know, there's some of these cases that have literally been through the wars and they've been held together with nothing more than linen thread and uh, wheat paste. <laughs> and you're thinking, wow, are we missing something? Yes, we are. We're missing technique. We're, mi we're missing construction. We're missing the correct leather choice. We're missing the, you know, the correct reinforcement. Uh, the, there's so much more to it than just the thread and what needles they used and what glue they used and things like that. 
It's the overall construction, the design, the craftsmanship uh, that, that makes up, the, you know, it's the most important part. But anyway, I'm, uh, I'm going off on one, <laughs> which I like to do. Thank you for joining me. Um, just doing a little bit of uh, stitching today and just having a conversation with you guys. This is the first YouTube live. And if you like it, guys, don't forget to give me a thumbs up and I'll just do more of them. Um, so if you feel like you've, uh, you've discovered something new or you enjoyed yourself, give me a thumbs up and don't forget to like and subscribe. Cheers, guys. Thanks a lot.